Questo. So enter is... Abbiamo qualche sì, problema organizzativo delle traduzioni, come, come vedremo. Sorry, just a uh, few technical details. We are preparing for translation. They can stay away from each other, not even when they're sitting at the table. They've already said that they don't agree because they're sitting far from each other. We have uh, our two guests with us, uh, Mrs. Uh, Alisa Eshet uh, Moses from Israel and Mrs. Gadir Hani from Palestine. So a big round of applause to them. E allora vi invito anche ad accogliere... And um, I invite you to warmly uh, welcome uh, the uh, Bishop of Sarajevo, a city that is uh, in our arts, uh, Mr. Pero Sudar. As I said, this blue is the uh, bracelet of uh, Women Wage Peace. This is a gadget that everyone wants, so you need to get it uh, before it's uh, starting to be sold. And this bracelet uh, is the uh, symbol uh, of this movement, uh, of this association, which uh, our two guests today will be presenting. We met uh, uh, with uh, some people of this movement in Jerusalem a few uh, uh, months ago, uh, and uh, we immediately became friends. Hence, uh, we decided to have them here. We absolutely wanted to have them here. Now, we are living in a world where there are many walls. We live in contexts where everything is difficult, where there is tension everywhere. where there's problems everywhere. How can we live in these contexts? Yesterday, Monsignor Pizzaballa told us many things. We are condemned to survive in these situations. Or maybe, can we work for life? Do we just have to wait for everything to pass away? Or maybe do we have an incumbent task, as in to cross these walls, to go beyond these walls? Where life becomes new and uh, there's new journeys, and new journeys are made possible. So this is the uh, uh, meaning of this event. This event telling us two stories, two difficult worlds, worlds which are very complex, like the world of Israel and Palestine and Bosnia. You know, I'm not very talkative as a facilitator because today I want to hear the very interesting stories of our guests. The meeting is going to be, the event is going to be uh, quite complex. As soon as uh, Alisa is going to be ready, <laughs> so we asked them to tell us their stories. And the story of this uh, movement, the Women Wage Peace, which is a very interesting movement, a very important movement in Israel. And uh, as you will be hearing, uh, this movement can overcome walls which maybe to us are impossible to overcome. So welcome once again to Alisa, and uh, I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. First, I want to thank uh, Emilia Gua Guarneri for inviting us to this event. We are very, very honored to be here. 
So, grazie mille again. Now I'm going to tell, us, tell you about our movement. Uh, forse yeah. abbiamo bisogno... Ecco. Yes, ok, that's ok. So, uh, um, I'm a little nervous and excited about all of you, so please excuse me if I'm doing it very, very slowly. But our goal is peace, so we have to be very patient. <laughs> so who are women wage peace? We are a women movement which includes more than 20,000 women in Israel. We are an Israeli movement of a variety of women, Arab, Christian, Jews, from the left side of Israel, from the right side and from the center, all are together making a new language of peace. Our, wait, oh, sorry. Okay. Our goal is being a lot of women together and men, by the way. Um, women Wedge Peace have 80% women and 20% men. The only uh, change is that women lead and men stand behind them. But we are all together. So we, we are trying to find a new language which says we know there are problems between the two sides, but the only solution will be to sit together, to talk about the problem and solve them without violence, without weapon. We are all human beings. We have our mind and we don't need weapon to solve things. We can not agree about everything, which is okay, but we need a new language of peace. No more terrorism, no more fighting each other, speaking together. So our, one of our goals is when we are now 20,000, 30,000, when we'll be two, three, four, six, seven million women, we can pressure the government to sit with the other side, saying, we want peace, you have to do because we are your voters. So this is one of our objectives. One of the other things is, well, we are women wedge peace. Women is an important part of it. Until today, in the, all, the, all the negotiations, there were men sitting around the table, discussing things, well, as you understand, it didn't really work. But we insist of putting us, Israeli, Palestinian women, around the table in the negotiation in this new language. Because we think women think a little differently and can make an, um, the change to uh, reaching a peace agreement. So what do we do really? You say, okay, you have nice words. What do you do on the ground? The first thing we do is um, we have a lot of little things we do in the communities. As you understand, sometimes you have an enemy. You think he's an enemy, you don't know him. But when you, as, when you get to know him as a person, you see, we are two same human beings. Why are, you, are we fighting? So this is the one of the things we do in every place in Israel, getting women together and doing a lot of uh, charity things, everything together, taking the walls down. And of course, training more and more women to be in center of uh, decision in Israel. Today we have 
uh, women wedge peace in our parliament. We have women uh, wedge peace in um, in the lobby in in the parliament. Okay, we are lobbyists, and we are part of every discussion now. This is a new thing. As you know, um, in there is a re resolution 1325 that was uh, founded in 2000 in the United Nations. It says that women have to be a part of every peace negotiation. And if you look in around the world, women, wherever it succeeded, women were there. In Liberia, in everywhere. Women made the change and um, to go over the barrier to peace. So maybe men need a little help for us, which is okay, but we are, together we can do that. If you see in the picture, you see this is one of the things we're doing. We, gathered, we started our movement in 2014. And this is uh, coming after a war we had. So we had, if you see in the picture, a lot of women coming to one place saying, okay, now we are starting a change. A march that we had from uh, Jericho to Jerusalem, you can see there are thousand, more than 20,000 women, Christian, uh, Jewish, Muslims. We had about a thousand uh, Palestinian women coming from the West Bank to this event. And this is something that has been never done before. And we have the support of, of the other side. Abu Mazen has um, sent 50 buses with women to this event. So you see, if you think and you put your head together, we can do that. Look at the picture, think as like Exodus. This is the new peace in the Middle East. Now, wh what are we going to do next? In, oct in October, first I'm inviting all of you to come to Israel in October. We have a journey for peace. We're going to, uh, again, be all together and make another step to peace. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll have peace. <laughs>
for the empowerment and economic development of women, and I'm also working as a volunteer for associations, and in particular for associations that are interested in women's issues and to fight against violence against women and to support the development of the Arab community in Najaf. And I joined uh, two years ago the Women Wage Peace Movement, uh, and uh, I decided to join uh, after uh, the uh, war in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and I saw how many women were there to uh, in this tent to achieve peace, uh, to end war in the region, because everything that is happening is a loss for both sides. Uh, and as an Arab Palestinian that lives in uh, Israel and it has relatives also on the other side, so uh, the other side is also my people, so I really wanted to do something. So as an Arab Palestinian woman living in Israel, I really wanted to do something active. I really wanted to uh, play a key role. I thought that through the movement I could make a change. I joined the movement because I do believe that things can change because uh, I used to live in a mixed city and I was aware of the importance uh, of uh, living together and uh, this is exactly what we have to achieve regardless of uh, religion and uh, with no conflict, living together, talking together and uh, having a dialogue. I then uh, moved to uh, uh, 18 years ago when I was 22 in the Nejef area and uh, at that time I uh, decided to settle there and uh, I started working in uh, an uh, Arabic village in 2000 where the second intifada and the situation was very complex because uh, I lived uh, among the Jews, but I was living with the uh, Arab people, and uh, so uh, I always had uh, friends uh, with my among my neighbors, my uh, Jewish neighbors. So I had maybe some prejudice about uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations, uh, especially when it comes to the interactions in this region, and in particular in this region there is. Uh, a specific reality because uh, there was a lack uh, of interaction. There were there was prejudice. There were common places on both sides. And uh, when uh, I there was intifada, I remember that uh, I felt sick uh, because I used to be used to something different to have uh, relations to my neighbors. And uh, my neighbors uh, used to have relations with me and my family. And so I remember that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, we used to make iftar together during the Ramadan. And even with our Christian uh, neighbors, when there was Christmas, we used to save our money to decorate together the Christmas tree. So I was really missing that aspect of my life in Nejef. And um, I then uh, met uh, a woman who became my boss at work. Uh, and uh, we tried uh, to promote meetings between Jewish and Arab women. We were trying to share commonalities and use commonalities to show to what extent we're close to each other. And considering specifically the nature of my work, that aspect could not go on for a long time. Then I could join an Israeli Arab Association promoting relations between the two sides. But then because of the war that was in place, we tried to do something, but we couldn't. It was hard to keep relations. And then we launched a workshop to try to overcome that block. And then later on, I joined associations and organizations that were really 
keen on uh, Israeli-Arab relations. There were schools uh, where there were uh, Arabs uh, and Jews, uh, and uh, we set up religious meetings. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, religious representatives uh, joining us, and I remember to what extent realizing and understanding to what extent we were close to each other. And uh, uh, today I work with Israeli women uh, in uh, the Negev area who never had a chance to meet people from other religions. And I could finally understand that change is gradual, is uh, little by little. And uh, women are likely to make the change because there are cities, there are Jewish cities, but also Arab cities, and there are interactions. Uh, that are sometimes too limited. Sometimes it's just about a few uh, exchanges of words, but women want to meet other women. So we started uh, organizing some uh, meetings and encounters. Today, women have relatives in the Gaza Strip, and some of them were dead. And so they are even more interested in joining our movement because they see that uh, they can shape uh, their own future and the future of their children. They understood that they are accountable for the education of children and as a consequence to educate them to peace regardless of religion. So they understood the importance of peace. On the press and on social media, we see every day to what extent the world is drifting towards fanatism and extremism, and what is done in the name of religion is not acceptable. We provide a different answer. We can talk with our Palestinian counterparts in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, and when they see us together with our Jewish sisters working together to achieve things together, well, little by little, people start understanding. They see that we can trigger a change in the Arab world. Well, uh, the, in the Arab world, I must say, sometimes communities are a bit close. Women sometimes cannot make decisions on their own, all alone. But still, we try, little by little, to carry out change, because change is possible. We need to work, Jewish, uh, Muslims, uh, uh, Christians, everybody. Everybody belonging to any political stream, to any religion, to build the peace, guaranteeing a safe future to all of us. Thank you. Right, so now video number two. Video number two. Thank you very much. I can tell you seeing um, this movie, these pictures of all us women together, you have to be there to feel the power. If you stand there, 
there is no other solution other than peace, really. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. I'm going to tell you just a little about myself and why did I get to Women Wedge Peace. I, I, grew up, I grew up in a little city called Ashdod. It's a small community in the Mediterranean uh, Sea in the south of Israel. I'm the eldest of four children. My parents immigrate to Israel. My mother was born in Morocco. My father was born in India. So as you understand, Israel is a variety of people which already made the first step. I grew up in a patriarchal um, society which said women should stay home, have no education, find a husband, and raise kids. A culture that is dominated by men. Already as a child, I refuse to get that. I thought this can't be the world. We are women, part of the community, and we have to change that. So I got the education, a degree, even went traveling by myself in Europe. This is the new women. And the most important thing, I teach my daughter that women can lead and women can make a change in the world. Today I am a chairman of an organization called VITSO, which is a Zionist organization helping kids and women deal with violence, abuse, and economic hardship. I believe the right of every human being to live a liberal, dignified life. Doesn't matter what your face is. Thank you. So without knowing really, this was my first connection to women wedge peace. I was a kid, but it already was in my mind. I was born into a country, then unfortunately, war became a way of life. As Israeli, it's clear to me that when we get 18, we finish school, we go to the army. I went to the army, my daughter went to the army, my son will go to the army. This has to stop. No more. So all of this, as a grown-up, as a mother to kids, I uh, gathered 500 women who started Women Wedge Peace. As I said, we have 80% women, but 20% men, which are equal. We do everything together. But, of course, we are in the head of the camp. So what is special about the movement? As I told you before, it's a move, woman movement. Um, and the variety of women we have. I can't think of any place in Israel and in the world that you have so many variety of uh, women that are together. Think, we have settlers in our movement. We have women from the right, from the left. This is, I think, we are, I would say it's a new patent. We have to put it a uh, new patent. Now, if anybody of you have been to Israel, you know, it's very, very hard to unify everybody to one place. Everyone has his own 10 ideas. So I think uh, Women Wedge Peace did a new thing about it. We have a long way to go. That's, it's not easy. 
But that's why we say that when we get women to the center of decision, center of the negotiation, peace will happen. And I'll just let me tell you, I'm not saying it will happen. It's already happening in our movement. Myself and Gadil, we are the best of friends, a real friend. We can think differently, but peace and agreement is in our hands. What was the real thing that maybe joined this uh, movement? In 2014, there were the abduction of three young uh, Israelis. And the, it's called the Tzuk Eitan. It's in Hebrew, Tzuk Eitan. In English, it means um, a solid rock started. June 14 until August 26, until we had a ceasefire. My daughter was a part of the Israeli army. She was fighting near Gaza. I, I didn't sleep at night. And then I decided, no more. I, as a woman, as a mom, as a citizen in my country, need to do something and change that. This has to stop. We can't stand in our youngest to the war. So it's time for us to enter the arena of influence until we get a political agreement. We are gathering more and more women to influence our government. And it doesn't have to be a right government or a left government. We are a power. As I said, when we'll be 7 million women, 8 million, and we will be 7 million, 8 million, they can't ignore us. They have to take our opinion. I, sh <laughs> I should say, we don't make the rules. We are not saying what to do, where to change the area in the, uh, in the land, who is right and who is wrong. We have to see the future. Look at the future. Please. We need a political agreement from both sides. We urge you to have this. So I should uh, conclude this with saying, I am ready for peace. Sono pro pronta per la pace. Thank you. Uh, video number two. Uh, la, conclu la conclusione di questo parte dell'incontro è con il video numero. So we will now conclude uh, this event with uh, video number three. Anna Lawahez Abu Mandi. Anishir El Milod. Anna Ismi Zoya Min Bet Lachem. Anna Ket Shalom. Anna Mustaida. Anna Mukhana. Anna Mustaida. Anna Mustaida Lis Salam. Anna Mustaida. Anna Mustaida. Anna Mukhana. Bene, grazie. Thank you. Thank you because um, uh, this is uh, uh, something new for us, uh, a new language for peace, uh, which starts like this. Two people, two people who have crossed the wall themselves, first of all. Now I'm going to give the floor to uh, Monsignor Perosudara, who is the auxiliary bishop of Sarajevo. We have all suffered from, for Sarajevo in the 1990s. And uh, today 
We're starting once again to uh, uh, understand what is happening in Sarajevo. Let's see what is happening in Sarajevo and uh, let's see what the walls are still there and what Monsignor Sudar is doing in Sarajevo. Thank you for being with us. Uh, he was uh, first working in uh, Zagreb and Dubrovnik, then he went to Sarajevo and uh, um, he now has... Uh, uh, he now is the auxiliary bishop. He's going to speak Italian, so it's going to be easier for you. Good morning to you all. It is difficult to talk after these two uh, very gentle and wonderful women, after all that they have said, after all that they have presented. That was, this is their daily life. The daily life is what is important. What I'm going to say is more theory. Theirs is practice. But clearly, we also need to talk about theory. So, uh, warm thanks to uh, Professor Guarnieri and uh, Mr. Aluigi for inviting me here to uh, participate uh, in this big event uh, focusing on culture and commitment for human promotion. So greetings to uh, Bishop Francesco, who is the shepherd of this wonderful church in Rimini. Greetings to all the archbishops and greetings to all of you. I deeply cherish what you are doing and the contribution that you want to give in order to create a better world. So I will have uh, uh, three um, bullet points in my presentation. So the topic of, this meet, of the meeting of this year focuses on two key concepts, as in peace and coexistence. It also assumes that uh, there can be places and circumstances where peace and coexistence may seem impossible. But I believe that everything is possible to all those who are available and ready to use the great gift of reason. Peace and coexistence, therefore, should be possible for everyone and everywhere. I am deeply convinced that in today's world, peace and coexistence are intertwined. One cannot exist without the other. Peace and coexistence go hand in hand. If peace just remains an ideal, it means that man does not want to use his reason. And he is wrong. If he, man thinks that peace can exist, if man is not ready to accept and to promote coexistence, Coexistence means peaceful life among different people based on people's willingness to accept each other and to respect each other, to respect who the others are. In order to accept other people, you have to acknowledge and respect other people's rights. I think that the long story of wars in Europe and the shortest story of peace in Europe over the past 15 years confirm what I've just said. I could continue dwelling on that, but I think it is enough to remember that all wars have and still have the idea to deny and to destroy other people's identity. Whereas peace is nourished by respect of diversity.
denying diversity and trying to destroy diversity was um, the underlying idea of Nazism, fascism, and communism. And we fear that the events of our time may jeopardize once again the ability of Europe to acknowledge, accept, and respect the differences. As European citizens and as world citizens, we are the heirs of long and horrible wars and of a fragile peace. The heritage, the bequeath left to future generations will depend on what we can do today, on what we can re-earn today. Peace is a gift only for those who are ready to welcome peace. Any generation has had to accept and pay the price of its peace. I think that the respect for other people as a prerequisite for peaceful coexistence is the price that we all have to pay. Reason tells us that every person has a value, is connected to God, is a creation of God, and therefore it is worthy of respect and solidarity because this is the only thing, this is the only way people can feel free. However, what is coexistence? There is an assumed conflict, a potential conflict between uh, individual identity and collective identity because uh, this conflict uh, jeopardizes uh, the future of peace and mankind. As an individual, the person has its own identity, making it uh, unique. Identity is a sense of belonging and is also a mix of uh, uh, factors in which people can identify themselves and their values. Only thanks to other people, a person can experience its own identity. Therefore, the identity is also received by others and is given to others. So if we look at things uh, from an anthropological and theological perspective, the other, other people are the starting point and the arrival point of human existence. Without others, no man could be born. Without other people, man could not perceive himself nor develop, not fulfill himself as a man. Therefore, the uh, topic concerning other people is somewhat the schizophrenia because on the one end it is clear that the man in order to be a man um, has to recognize and acknowledge others and communities and citizens are supported by other communities and citizens today more than ever So identity, individual identity, and different identities are two sides of the same coin, the human coin. The inclination or the need for having one's own identity means that you have to recognize other people's identity.
Acknowledging identity to everyone is possible only if uh, different citizenships are acknowledged. So why are other people often considered as a threat? This is totally illogical. I fear that uh, uh, people who don't want to be deceived must be brave enough to identify the real reasons for tensions between identity and uh, other people's identity. We need to acknowledge men, cultures, nations, and civilization. I'm increasingly convinced that uh, a negative presentation of uh, uh, differences uh, in the world uh, may just uh, cover the old and new divisions uh, in the world. The real reason uh, is that uh, somebody is trying uh, to implement uh, a terrible world system. There is no peaceful coexistence now between those who die because they eat too much and those who die because they don't eat at all. There is a tremendous conflict between those who have everything and those who have nothing. Those who are too much informed and those who are poor. Il problema fondamentale del nostro mondo. The real problem of our world is a selfishness, too much selfishness. That leads to different forms of injustice, discrimination, and lie. This is why the world we live in is too bitter and dangerous. We need to get to the truth. Then I'm going to talk about identity. I'll just give an example. During the war, some centers of power wanted to show that the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina was the consequence of the unwillingness of people to coexist and live in peace. The Catholic Church, therefore, opened up inter-ethnic schools as a sign of its opposition to an inhuman ideology because it was focused on intolerance and ethnic and religious conflict. Con queste scuole si voleva incoraggiare. These schools wanted to encourage and to educate people to peaceful coexistence. These schools were uh, opposed by uh, uh, some uh, people at national level and also at international level. National opposers did not agree that these schools were attended by students of different nations and religions because, in their opinion, that was going to destroy the national identity of uh, uh, students. Whereas uh, international opposers reproached our curriculum because they said that our curriculum could just encourage the different identities of students. So uh, this twofold approach to the Catholic schools for Europe shows that multi-ethnicity as a topic needs to be clarified and understood even at cognitive level. I'm now going to talk about uh, peaceful coexistence. Undoubtedly, 
The world today is wondering whether it is possible to make people live, belonging to different cultures and religions live together in peace. How should society be organized and structured? Which values should underlie citizenship in order to ensure conditions of peaceful coexistence? Is it possible? Is it possible to have a world where different national ethnic identities live together in peace and at the same time having political identity? This is a very topical issue, a topical question. And uh, this question does not only apply to uh, uh, some countries, it applies to all countries around the world. Clearly, the multi-ethnic nature of mankind and coexistence is not a real problem. It does not stem out uh, from the human nature or the behavior of laymen, common people. Man, by its own nature, is a social being. He, man looks for the others, looks for other people, because man cannot live on his own. And clearly, today's man needs to be help and educated to become aware of this truth in order to live it in its relations with others. We will be the only one to be promoting this peaceful society. So the starting point of this approach is awareness. Awareness that diversity and other people do not impoverish us, but can just enrich us. La lezione deve essere purtroppo fatta in una... However, that has to be said in a simple and convincing way because uh, unfortunately, we are all selfish, especially we in the Western world. Therefore, peaceful coexistence cannot be reached without neglecting the fact that man, as a social being, is also selfish. Therefore, we have to enlarge our thinking, and we have to convince the rich, the powerful, and the violent that solidarity, justice, and equal dignity are in their own interest. Because uh, this is the only way to fight against and win against uh, those uh, who do not want to reach peaceful coexistence. It is a paradox uh, that uh, selfishness uh, says that we needed to abandon the culture of uh, selfishness, uh, uh, pushing the world uh, to reach it's death. We see everywhere that the future of the powerful and the weak, of the hungry and the not hungry, the people who are free and those who are not given freedom are in the same situation. In addition to this threat, uh, we live a quiet life, whereas uh, every day, because of wars and poverty, hundreds of thousands of innocents are dying. And there is still the question, which is open, 
who would be ready to learn such a lesson and what should we do in order to have a better and freer world? God saved the world through men and continues to save the world through the men who do not surrender to the ideals that today seem impossible. Human history teaches us that the best ideas can only give results if they are supported by uh, uh, sacrifice and if they are promoted. In theological terms, we should say that men and mankind should redeem their best ideas as God had to redeem his best idea, as in man. Therefore, we need to hope and to work so that God can work with men and can find people helping him in men. Men coming from all countries, cultures, and religions to give a new prospect to mankind. Citizenship can just work if it is multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious, if the full mankind will learn to accept, respect, and appreciate among virtues and values, such as man as a supreme and central value, equal dignity, freedom, justice, solidarity, and not only right to equality, but also the right to differences. Sometimes uh, this right is denied. The world uh, situation shows that the famous global governance cannot on its own uh, create the right context for uh, a multi-citizenship. The world of knowledge, culture, NGOs, and especially religions uh, need to work together, need to commit themselves. Common people must be uh, willing and able to live and promote the values of multi-citizenship. However, people need no longer to be afraid, and they must be encouraged by all authorities, and religious authorities, first of all. I'm convinced that the promotion of multi-citizenship today pays excellent service to the promotion of human dignity and the progress of mankind. This is also shown by religions. According to the Apocalypse book, the kingdom of skies it consists of an immense multitude of nations, races, peoples, and languages. Therefore, Christianity has to take account of the coexistence in the world where it becomes increasingly the condition for its own survival. As I live in the besieged city of Sarajevo, with people who hate others, it has become clear to me that peaceful coexistence in multi-citizenship will only be possible if we find the way and the courage to educate new generations, so as to help them know their own identity and to acknowledge and accept other people's identity. This is why Catholic schools for Europe were conceived as multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-religious, and at the same time, their curriculum focuses on the positive value of the national and ethnic identity of each student and on the love for the common country.
Despite uh, historical injustices uh, and the crimes of the last war, we still have a country where uh, a simple person commits suicide after seeing his neighbors slaughtered, slaughtered by its nationals. Before committing suicide, this person had written on a piece of paper in a very simple way, because our people are simple in Sarajevo, that he could no longer live because he no longer had anyone to drink coffee with. So in that village, there were still the members of his religion, just like before the war. So it's not that he missed the people to drink coffee with, but he no longer had mankind. He no longer felt uh, humankind. This is why, to me, a crime against mankind is the fact that the international community, such as the United States, pretend they want to impose peace in our country, but in order to safeguard its own interests, the U.S. has imposed a political system making it impossible for Bosnia-Herzegovina to live together in peaceful coexistence. Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is a country where uh, people, cultures, and different religions have always been living together. So many people support multi-ethnic citizenship, but many people say that this is a utopia. It is a duty, it is a task for all of us to fight against those forces and alliances trying to use the world diversity to impose conflicts. Believers also prefer to commit for a human and peaceful project, even when they're sure about their failure. They never want to engage in something that is inhuman. Multi-ethnic citizenship cannot fail. It must be an opportunity, a project to be implemented. My country was an example because life, even harsh life, could create multi-citizens. That was the result of the willingness and the need for the human being to live to survive and to survive to live. It may seem a play on words, but it is not. Intellectual honesty make us consider diversity and multi-citizenship as a value. Men, as an individual, has to be acknowledged not as a value, but uh, as the maximum value of our earthly values. Then the diversity is also value, because uh, a man is the uh, only uh, stakeholder in the multi-ethnic uh, um, reality. Diversity and identity are both uh, needed. And these also apply when promoting the meeting of different nations, cultures, and religions. Multi-ethnic citizenship cannot be opposed to the fundamental right of people or vice versa. On the contrary, the protection of fundamental rights of people 
shows that multicultural society is the only way where people can live and can enrich themselves. Multi-citizenship is an asset if and when the single identities are considered as values. So identity and diversity are the only prerequisite to ensure peace and coexistence in today's world. To conclude, I'm going to quote the words expressed when the uh, um, school diplomas were given to the best student of our school in Tuzla. This guy uh, was a young man grown up in a Muslim family. And he said, when he was given the diploma, four years ago, I was in danger of making a big mistake that many young people of this city are doing, as in uh, uh, not to enter this school. Over the last four years, I was exposed to many radical ideas. But the idea that won is that in any man, there's a something deserving attention and respect. Before judging others, you need to put yourself in the other person's shoes. The, the past four years were the best years of my life. The example of my teachers, rather than their words, have conveyed me the values who are now in me. They're now my values. This is why I will not forget and I will not betray my roots, which are in this, still in this school. End of quote. End, end of this presentation, which I could hardly read in Italian, and I apologize for that. We have uh, still a couple of minutes before ending our event. So, Gadir asked me the floor. She wants to say something. She wants to say something to our Bishop Suder. I would like to thank uh, His Excellency. I would like to go back to the last uh, point you raised. It is very important to talk about uh, the uh, values in our life. We heard about uh, interreligious leaders meetings in Florence uh, not long ago. We need to work practically. And uh, well, uh, talking is easy, acting is more difficult. Uh, and uh, I'm a multifaceted. Uh, I am Arab, uh, Muslim, Palestinian. I'm a woman, a member of a minority. So these are all my facets, uh, my several identities. But where do these identities meet with other identities? So. Exa that's where we need to find commonalities uh, so we can have diversity also inside the same house, uh, inside my own family, very same family. We, th we can have different political positions, but this is normal. The point is to prevent these identities from becoming an obstacle to cooperation. So we, uh, I, I don't have to find what makes you my enemy or my rival, not at all. We need to find uh, uh, sort of uh, meeting points, that's it. So I'm expressing here the orientation of our movement. So we are all equal, we are all the same, me, Elisa, the other members, we're all together. We stand by each other, side by side. That's why we encourage the participation of all women with no distinction, because the more we're going to be numerous, 
the more we're going to be heard. We are messengers of our own identity, regardless of which this identity is. We are all messengers. That's what counts. So I really urge you, please get out of this room and ask yourselves, what can I do to live in peace with my neighbor, with my brother, my neighbor, my friend? How can I live in peace with other people who are different from me? That's the, the point of finding commonalities to live in peace. Then, to sum up, w women can play a key role in that. Women can have a great influence, not only inside a house, but also all around her. Say, women put their self aside because for women, the us is important. We is important for women. So women will certainly have a greater and greater impact. I'm sure of that. In Haifa last year, there were many fires starting from uh, Arab villages where there was a radical Islamic leadership. They invited all Haifa inhabitants to come and spend the night uh, at our places when there was the threat of fires. So Haifa inhabitants came to us to spend the night at our places. So again, you see, it's a message we can send from here, from everywhere. We are all accountable, each one of us, of our future, regardless of uh, uh, extremists that are present anywhere. So the religious centers, the cultural centers need to be seen uh, as made of people who are human beings. Each individual, each human being can give a contribution for peace and uh, living in common. Well, maybe Alisa wants to say something. <laughs> we live this thing every day. No one lets us forget the war there is in the Middle East. So, Gadir and myself are real proof of what she said. Women and a new language for everybody. So, you can see we all have this uh, blue bracelet. Some of you have this. This is f to rem remind us every day when we get up, when we go to sleep, when we go to work. We have a task to do. This is, will be the peace. When I take this off my hand, we will have peace. So I want to give it to you, so you will remember every day. This is the struggle for peace. And you're only allowed to take it off when we have peace. I think we have... I think we could really enjoy these words, these experiences, the experiences of this movement, the experiences of these Catholic schools for Europe that are quite controversial in the country of origin because when you bring something new, there's always somebody who is against it. And uh, even a gesture of peace uh, is not automatically welcome. Sometimes, I mean, it's easier to accept conflict. It's almost more convenient uh, to remain uh, in a hostile setting. Instead, peace is a work, is a daily work. It takes effort, as Elisa just said telling us about the, the, the meaning of these uh, bracelets. We are all messengers every day, every day of this work, of this struggle. We are here today together and we could listen to these beautiful experiences. And I would like to, to say something about what uh, Mr. Suda said and using the reason makes peace possible. So we need to have recourse to our mind, to our reason. 
I mean, this is at the heart of these educational activities of these uh, multi-ethnic schools. Uh, each individual can be a messenger of a new language, of a language likely to sort of bring people together, live together, and uh, live in common. This is possible. And it is possible to enjoy these opportunities together. And this is a great opportunity we had here today because we this is everybody's task. This is everybody's work. Each should give their own contribution. So let's do not miss this opportunity. Let's uh, so continue this work. And the meeting in Rimini tries to give its contribution. That's why we ask you to support also financially this meeting, to keep on sharing and celebrating these messages. So please do not hesitate to donate anything you can, to make a little donation. Every little helps. So I want to close our beautiful encounter today. I thank our guests for their wonderful words and messages. Thank you very much indeed. So we're going to have a Q&A session with the audience, with Alisa and Gadir this evening at eight, sorry, at 6.45 at the Spazio Muri, at the wall space. So thank you very much and see you maybe this evening. The Muslim, Christian and a Jew on the table. We can achieve anything.